Now, I want to uh, start the event by introducing our very prominent guest, Madame Lea Perecres. And you are the Deputy Director of Operations for Europe and MENA region at the Institute for Economics and Peace in Brussels. You're responsible for operations, outreach and partnerships. And you are also very passionate about topics related to peace, conflict, security and human rights. Before this, you also worked in the human rights field as a human rights investigator and policy advisor in Brussels. And we are very much delighted to have you here today, Leah. Thank you for participating. And uh, I will soon leave the floor to you to tell us more about this year's Global Peace Index and the Corona's impact on it. So very much welcome, Leah. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you also for inviting me here to speak today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation today. Um, let's see if I can open that here. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen now and the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so today I'll be presenting, as was said before, the Global Peace Index 2020 and also our new COVID-19 and peace report. Um, you are very lucky. These reports were just released yesterday. So you're one of the very first audiences to be seeing this presentation and getting the inside information. So as a brief overview, I know that some of you are familiar with our work, but the Institute for Economics and Peace is a research institute. Um, our research is used widely by international organizations like the United Nations, the OECD, the World Bank, et cetera. We also partner with a number of universities around the world and, and in Europe, um, integrating our um, positive peace model into different master's and bachelor degree programs. Um, we also have, you know, a little propaganda here about our website reach and, and our book references. Um, so those are there for you as well. We are based in Sydney, Australia, and we have offices in New York, Brussels, The Hague, Mexico City, and in Harar. Um, as was previous said, I'm here in Brussels. So a little bit about what the Global Peace Index is. This is the 14th edition of the Global Peace Index. It ranks 163 countries, which covers about 99.7% of the world's population, and it uses 23 specific indicators. Something to be mentioned is that these indexes usually take into account from about out March to March of each of the previous years. Um, this year we extended it a little bit due to all of the ongoing international events. Um, so there is a little bit more recent data in there, but for the most part, that's where the data cuts off. Okay, so looking into the indicators, they're separated into three different families. The first one is ongoing domestic and international conflict. This includes things like relations with neighboring countries, um, the number of deaths from conflict, as well as how many international conflicts the country is involved in. Um, the second set of indicators is societal safety and security. So this has to do with homicide rates, incarceration rates, as well as some qualitative um, indicators such as the feeling of safety walking at night in your neighborhood and also perceptions of criminality um, in your community. And the final measure is militarization. And this has to do with weapons, imports, exports, size of your armed services, as well as uh, military expenditure as a part of the GDP. So looking into the fun part, some of the findings from, from our index, this is the map from the 2020 Global Peace Index. Um, the darker reds are countries that uh, ranked lower on the index, whereas the darker greens are the countries that, that ranked higher. Um, as you can see, Europe is the most peaceful region um, I also want to note that during this presentation, when I talk about Europe, it's not EU, 
it's Europe as a continent, um, which also includes Turkey. You know, Australians created this index, so we have to give them a little wiggle room. <laughs> but yes, um, so apart from that, you can see that there's a lot of red in the Middle East, um, as well as a little bit in North Africa and, and following down into Sub-Saharan Africa. Some of the other highlights. So uh, the global average of peacefulness has deteriorated by 0.34%. And this is the ninth time we've seen a deterioration in the past 12 years. So there were only three years where peace actually increased globally. So there were 81 countries that became more peaceful and 80 countries that deteriorated in peacefulness. If we look at the trends globally, um, we see that there's been a lot of improvements with terrorism impact. It's dropped about 75% in the past couple of years, which is phenomenal. Um, homicides over the past decade have been um, decreasing uh, steadily. And weapons imports and exports has also improved, meaning there's less of it happening around the world. The deteriorations that we've seen are mostly driven by um, internally displaced people and refugees. There's been an increased population there. Um, intensity of internal conflicts in countries around the world have deteriorated in peacefulness. They've become more intense, um, as well as political terror. We've seen an increased amount of political terror um, in this index. So continuing on with some of the more specific highlights that are country related, Iceland has remained the most peaceful country in the world for a number of years now. From the 2020 index compared to the 2019 index, Azerbaijan and Armenia have seen the largest improvements. If we look at the different regions, nine different regions throughout the world, Russia and Eurasia was the region that had the largest improvement overall. Um, and as I said before, Europe remains the most peaceful region. Um, and this is despite some small deteriorations in some of the indicators, including in political instability. Some of the less exciting highlights, um, or not exciting, but um, less happy highlights. <laughs> Afghanistan remains the world's least peaceful nation. Um, the situation in Afghanistan has been deteriorating for over a decade now. Um, it has been in the bottom five for at least the past five years. Um, and Benin and Nicaragua saw the largest deteriorations. I'll get more uh, into why in a little bit. Um, furthermore, while we saw Russia and Eurasia have the greatest improvement, we see that South America and Central America and the Caribbean is included in, in that, um, have had the largest regional deteriorations in peacefulness. Well, the Middle East and Africa, however, remain the least peaceful region. So South America, Central America, and Caribbean are decreasing the fastest. They still have not yet reached the level of Middle East and North Africa. Um, on the positive side, deaths from terrorism and intensity of internal conflict decreased in Middle East and North Africa in this past year compared to the past. Um, we can say that the demise of ISIS greatly contributed um, to those numbers. So everybody always likes to know who are the 10 most peaceful countries. So here's the list for you. Um, I'll add in, I, I collected some of the statistics about Sweden um, for the audience. Um, Sweden was the 15th most peaceful country in the world. Um, and if we look at the region of Europe, it's number 10. Um, it's very strong in societal safety and security. Um, and it is still pretty strong in domestic and international conflict. Um, the indicators where Sweden did not perform as well as others had to do with weapons exports, um, as well as the economic cost of violence, which also has to do with these exports in the military industry. And here are the 10 least peaceful countries. As I mentioned before, these bottom five countries, these have pretty much been the same countries for the past five years in a row. Um, Yemen is the only one that's bounced in and out of the bottom five. 
Okay, again, going into the most improved countries, we have Armenia and Azerbaijan as the top two. Um, this, of course, has to do with the stabilization of the conflict between the two, um, we, better neighborly relations, et cetera. And the other countries are listed there as well, most improved. And the five most deteriorated countries, um, Benin is number one. It has had a series of, um, of sporadic clashes after the elections last year, as well as some political um, instability. And if I remember correctly, it also had neighborly issues with Nigeria after there were some border closures due to trafficking. So that was the statistics for last year's Global Peace Index compared to this year's Global Peace Index. So now I'm going to open the data a little wider and look into the trends over the past decade. So if we look at peace overall in the world oh, since 2008, so 12 years, um, as I mentioned before, the majority of the years have seen a decrease in peacefulness since the year prior with the three years 2013, 2014, and 2019 um, showing the opposite effect. So here we see the, the world becoming less peaceful as, as the graph goes higher. Okay, this part can be skipped for now. So another trend that we see is inequality in global peace. So we see that the highest peace countries are becoming more peaceful and they are really accelerating in their commitment towards peace, whereas the least peaceful countries are ranking lower and lower every year. Their, their GPI score, it becomes worse and worse. So here really, I mean, you can see that there's a huge inequality in peace um, starting basically from 2012. So when, before I talked about the three um, families of indicators, this one is safety and security. Um, so as I mentioned, deaths from terrorism have fallen 75%, um, which is the lowest it's been in about a decade. Um, however, refugees and internally displaced people have been increasing. You can see there on the graph quite dramatically. Um, and while 70 million people have been displaced by violence, this is also including all of the people who have been displaced due to climate related risks, um, which I'll get into a little bit more later. Um, we've also seen that homicide rates have been plummeting over the past decade. The second set of indicators that we discussed was ongoing conflict. So we see that battle deaths um, have fallen since 2014, which was some of the, the height of the Syrian civil war battles with ISIS, et cetera. Um, but the number of total conflicts continues to, to increase as well as the intensity of these. So there's a little bit of, of maneuvering there that, should, that to be seen where battle deaths are falling, but if conflicts are increasing, what kinds of conflicts are these? What, what are the differences that have been taking place? And the last set of indicators was militarization. So this always kind of surprises audiences because we hear superpowers talking about increasing militarization, increasing budgets, um, the NATO budget, et cetera, but armed forces personnel have decreased over the past decade and now are only kind of tapering off. We expect it to stay about the same, um, maybe even decrease further due to coronavirus, we'll see. And the same goes for military expenditure. If you're looking at the global budgets, um, that's what the graph actually looks like. I think if you were to look maybe just at superpowers or just at Europe, it may look different. Um, but in the global picture, it's been decreasing quite a bit. Um, and then lastly there, we have the weapons imports and exports, um, a, which has been uh, a sustained increase, but of course with, with bumps here and there due to geopolitical um, events as well as economies, et cetera. So one of the main highlights that we chose for the Global Peace Index this year, and we actually chose it a couple of months ago because it was one of the 
most prominent um, findings from our research is that civil unrest has been increasing dramatically over the past decade. So from 2011 to 2019, the number of riots, general strikes, and anti-government demonstrations increased by 244% globally. And a lot of this has happened in Europe. Um, however, 65% of the demonstrations in Europe were nonviolent over the past 10 years. We also see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's had about an 800% increase in civil unrest over the past decade um, and in Europe in the Middle East North Africa um, or sorry Middle East North Africa we've seen the opposite effect it hasn't it hasn't um, decreased dramatically but it's decreased a bit and that's often because with the Arab Spring demonstrations um, reaching their peak in 2011, often those demonstrations transformed into some other kind of conflict that wasn't necessarily classified as civil unrest. And lastly, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit further. This was actually written before the, the current situation happening in the United States. Um, it was predicted that because of coronavirus and the impending economic recession that demonstrations and riots are only going to increase um, and this is particularly true for North America and Europe. So one of the things that we do in every global peace index is we look at the economic impact of violence um, each year. So in 2020 alone it costs 14.5 trillion US dollars. And this is equivalent to 10.6% of the world's GDP, which is incredible. And so what we always ask our audience to do is to think about if this were reduced by just 10%, what that money could go towards. This could be, you know, the economic reconstruction for COVID. This could be um, put into peace building, development, et cetera. Just just 10%. I mean, even just 1% could make a huge difference. Um, and, and this 10% is, is greater than the world's, than, if I remember correctly, the last year's um, total foreign direct investment budget for the globe was about 10% of what the economic impact of violence is. So how do we measure this? What numbers do we look at when we're trying to evaluate the economic impact of violence? Um, in our report, there's a very specific overview of this if you're interested in learning more about the calculations. Um, but otherwise, here's a general um, breakdown. We look at direct and indirect costs. Um, so the largest is military expenditure, followed by internal security expenditure. And we also look into things like homicide, including that indirect loss of like, what does that life cost? If it's a person who died, who can no longer be involved in the economy, et cetera. Um, we looked into direct conflict, different kinds of violent crimes, suicide, et cetera. So another chapter that we have is on peace and ecological threats. So we decided to create an ecological threat register. And this looks at the different kinds of ecological threats that are present in our world, such as food shortages, water shortages, um, natural disasters, et cetera, and looked at it compared to our theory of positive peace, which I'm going to explain in a little while, just brief over it, because I think some of you um, already have knowledge of this. Um, and as well as different economic settings to look at how different countries are going to be able to build resilience, which countries have resilience towards these kinds of things. Um, we had a shorter chapter on this in last year's report. And one thing that we found is that countries that are more peaceful are more resilient to environmental disasters. They had the same amount of environmental disasters as as any other part of the world. You know, Mother Nature doesn't discriminate um, based on, on how the country is performing that year. Um, but we found that there's less, less deaths, um, less property damage, and people can return to their homes much faster when peace is higher in a country. 
So that's what we found last year. And that's what really like brought us to do all of this specific research on this topic. That was a bit of um, a sidebar. So this graph <laughs> on natural disasters covers the natural disasters over the past four decades. Um, if you can, if you can look at 1980 versus 2018, um, the number of natural disasters has quadrupled. Most of these are meteorological and hydrological events. So if you look at this and then you also couple this with the fact that we estimate that by 2050, climate change is going to create 86 million additional uh, migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 40 million from South Asia, and 17 million from Latin America, we can see that there's going to be a huge impact as this graph continues to increase. I mean, there already has been a very large impact from, from migrants globally, um, and we're only expecting this to, to increase. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of the threats that we looked into. Our report does go into more. Um, I highly encourage you to go look at it if you're, if, if you're interested in this topic exactly. Um, one of the risks that we covered are water-related risks. So there are currently two billion people who live in zones that are at risk of, of water scarcity. Um, and that increase, and then, sorry, there's 2 billion who live in areas that have water scarcity issues. There's a further 4 billion people who experience one month out of the year with water-related risks. So grouping that together, you're looking at 6 billion people who are going to have water issues. When we're looking at this through a conflict or development lens, we see that this is a threat multiplier. If you have issues with access to water, it's gonna displace people, it's gonna cause further grievances. Governments are gonna be really um, stressed trying to find different ways to cope with this, et cetera. And we see a similar thing with food security. So I, as I said before, I'm gonna explain positive peace in a little while. Um, actually, I think right after this slide. But food security and peacefulness have a strong correlation. If you look at the countries that are more peaceful, they tend to be more food secure. This is extremely important now, especially in the time of COVID, because COVID is going to have a direct impact on food security, even in developed countries. We saw people hoarding groceries, that kind of thing. Agricultural businesses are changing. Um, the food transport businesses are changing. So the, the countries that are invested in positive peace are going to be able to have further resilience and still stay pretty secure, even though they may be impacted. So positive peace, like I promised, I'm just going to very briefly go over it because I was told before that some of you will have some knowledge on this already. So positive peace, what is it? It's the attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. And how we created positive peace, which is also partly why I started with the Global Peace Index, is because we had the index running for a number of years. Into every index, we look at 10 to 15,000 different data sets. So we analyzed that and we were like, okay, great, we can tell you exactly what's wrong with the world, exactly what's great with the world. And then it was like, okay, but what do we do with that? Like, how can we be an instrument of change? How can we look at our data? and make change with it or suggest change with it. So we put all of our data from a number of years into a strainer and we came out with eight different pillars, eight different areas that if countries invest in these eight pillars and you have to invest in all of them, you're going to have more peace, which means that you're going to have a higher per capita income, you're gonna have higher GDP growth per annum, you're gonna have better performance on SDGs, you're going to have resilience to not only environmental and climate related risks, but also to exogenous shocks, which includes things like a pandemic. So we found positive peace as kind of this new form of, of development that can be applied in any situation, whether it be a country level, whether it be 
uh, local level and we've been running workshops on this specifically. And just as a quick snapshot, here's our 2019 positive peace index to show you which countries were we found excelling in all eight pillars and investing in all eight pillars um, versus those that were not. And this can also be found on our website. So now shifting the conversation into coronavirus and peace. Um, you'll see why in a couple of minutes, why I wanted to outline positive peace before introducing um, this section. So this year we decided that it's quite necessary to come up with a special edition report on coronavirus and peace. We wanted to do the quantitative analysis um, to explore the cross sector between these two. Some of our key findings, the first one is that the level of air travel um, in a country strongly correlated with the number of cases of coronavirus. So we saw that countries that had higher numbers of passengers in airplanes that in the year before, so we assumed that it was going to be the same the, the following year or roughly the same, those were the countries that were hardest hit. We're talking US, China, Spain, Italy, they were all higher on the air travel um, estimations and higher on the coronavirus cases. And we also have a graph of that in our report too. So unfortunately, we expect most of the indicators from the Global Peace Index, those 27 indicators into three families, we expect that they're going to deteriorate because of coronavirus. We do, however, think that military expenditure is going to become better. Um, there's going to be less military expenditure because countries are going to have to reshuffle their budgets. They're going to have to focus on their domestic economies rather than on external conflicts and military spending. We've seen, I mean, this was only this data only marks up to a couple of weeks ago, so there's also a little bit of change between then and now. Um, but some kinds of crime have decreased during lockdown, um, drug dealing, um, homicides, et cetera. But we also see that there's increase in suicide and mental illness and domestic violence as well as a result of lockdown. And finally, this was also before the, um, this was written in May, I guess now. So the US and Europe were expected to see an increase in political instability. There again, we're talking about civil unrest. We're talking about how leaders are going to respond to increased grievances, um, both social and economic grievances that these countries will face. So continuing on into some of the international items, um, we see that multilateralism is being impacted by COVID. Um, the trust in these organizations, the bashing of them, et cetera, um, people are really changing their perspectives on what their role is, if they're mitigating risks well, et cetera. We estimate that UN peacekeeping operations, the funding there is going to decrease as well as overseas development aid simply because countries are going to prioritize their own economies. So we think that there are some countries that are extremely fragile in this situation. Some of them are listed there, Liberia, Afghanistan, Burundi, and South Sudan. And we also expect that countries that don't necessarily have the proper pre-economic conditions may suffer in trying to rehabilitate their economies, um, specifically those with low credit ratings. They will find it extremely hard to borrow. Um, so that's Brazil, Pakistan, Argentina, and Venezuela. And of course, all of these kinds of economic hardships um, create grievances amongst populations. So one of the things that we did was we looked at the positive peace ranking of each country together with the economic strength. When talking about the economic strength, we thought of four economic preconditions that would better um, suit a country to be able to return to their pre-COVID um, economy. So those are low central government debt, low unemployment rates, low tax revenue um, relative to GDP, as well as low dependence on international trade. So with those four elements, we created this economic strength um, 
side here. We can see that Sweden is both high on positive peace and economic strength. So bon chance to you. Um, and as well, we see countries, smaller countries in, in Europe as well, like Latvia and Slovakia, they're going to really struggle because a lot of their economies were dependent. Um, so that's definitely something that we've picked up from our research thus far. Um, and this is my last slide here, or second to last. Um, one of the topics that I thought would be useful, I think, for us to open up to for a group conversation as well, is what can we expect after the COVID-19 pandemic as far as each of the pillars of positive peace goes. So here we have some of our, our expectations um, listed. Um, for example, acceptance of the rights of others. Um, there's a lot of mistreatment towards minorities right now, particularly also towards people, uh, Chinese people or people of Chinese um, descent or even any Asian population are facing a lot of um, discrimination or harassment, et cetera. So we expect that to decrease high levels of human capital. We're predicting that youth are, are going to be um, in greater unemployment levels. Um, sound business environment. We expect that economies are gonna really struggle um, getting back started again. Like I said before, there are some that are gonna have trouble borrowing. There are some that may collapse, et cetera. So this is just kind of a list to get us started on the conversation. Um, and if, you had any questions today that won't be answered in the question and answer session, please feel free to um, write us, contact us on social media. You can contact me on social media um, and ask your questions. So thank you all. I hope that wasn't too long. Um, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. Let me stop screen sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Leah. This was very, very interesting and fruitful, but also very concerning. Um, uh, there's a number of great challenges that we're facing, not only due to the corona pandemic, uh, but also due to violence and uh, uh, the superpowers geopolitical uh, situation, or uh, as some would call it also game. Uh, also, we have the climate uh, crisis and the climate change impact. Um, what, what can Sweden and the EU do in this situation in order to change the negative trends here? I mean, as I was um, saying before, I think investing in positive pieces is, is going to be the way forward. If that's how you're going to be able to grow your GDP faster than otherwise, we have this graph from, from the report that shows that if you're investing in positive peace, your, your GDP is gonna grow 2% faster than if you're not. So things like that are going to really create a level of resilience for when and if coronavirus were to restart and have a second wave or a third wave, et cetera. Um, I think we also need to be supportive of multilateral um, multilateralism and international organizations. We are going to need, especially in Europe, um, travel coordination. Um, we can talk about having investments for those smaller countries that are going to suffer more, um, et cetera. So definitely investing in positive peace, um, definitely having some sort of renewed trust for international institutions. Um, as a lot of people have been saying, this is, of course, a chance to, to reignite different commitments to climate change and mitigating those risks. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. So those are just a couple of the things that we could be really shifting our mindset towards in, in the coming months and years. Thank you. And uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I will start to read out some of the questions that has popped up so far. I want to continue on the uh, multilateral institutions level. There is another question regarding how the UN can tackle these negative trends. What are the role of the UN in this specific situation? Well, I mean, the UN has, has quite a bit of power in quite a difficult geopolitical situation right now with certain 
a number of world leaders who are not in support of this multilateral organization. So it's in a very precarious, fragile state, I would say. But at the same, and, and since we expect the UN peacekeeping budgets to drop, I think the UN is going to face a lot of challenges um, when trying to bounce back from this. I mean, it has to be thinking at this time, how are they going to not only adjust their internal budgets, but try to continue the funds that they're getting from countries that are working on their local economies. So I think the UN is going to have a fair amount of political work to do before they can start to get their hands on work done. They're going to need to convince a lot of world leaders in, in their success. So while I think that there is great potential for the UN to be committed to, to mitigating some of the, the risks of conflict that are going to come not only from the pandemic, but from these climate risks that I discussed before. I, I have hope <laughs> that they'll be able to do it, but I don't know if for the short term how successful they'll be. Thank you. And um, there is another question uh, from a person here that he, he wants to know more about peace in the North African countries. So if you can tell us a little bit more about that region. Sure. Um, I don't have all of the statistics on all of the countries off the top of my mind. Um, but let me pull up my slide from before. Oh, well, I guess you can't see it as well. Um, but in North Africa, there's really quite, quite a mix of different levels of peacefulness across the board. I mean, I would call some of the more painful spots growing pains. When you talk about a country that's becoming a democracy, trying to become a democracy, in the short term, you're going to see a lot of conflict. In the long term, I think that, that many democratic countries have, have gone through these, what I call, growing pains. Mm. Um, I would suggest that you look at the index in depth yourself, because I, I don't have all the statistics in my head. Um, but I hope that that answer was was sufficient for the time being and I'm happy to answer any questions um, by email or social media once I have the data sets in front of me. Yeah, there is a lot of data in the reports and it's a very, very impressive work that uh, your organization is doing. It's really, really great to have all of this data, even if it's, of course, very uh, concerning as uh, as we talked about earlier. So there is another question uh, uh, that is, uh, how are weapons import and export decreasing when military expenditure and sales of weapons are globally increasing? I believe that CIPRI shows such figures. I have no figures at hand. Okay, great. Well, when we look at militarization overall, we're looking at a number of different sub indicators, not only not only weapons. I mean, you can see if you remember correctly, the weapons import graph was quite loopy, but overall um, increasing and in military expenditure had almost this hammock effect. So what you can often see is that while countries are maybe spending more or less on weapons, that may be counteracted by spending more or less on different aspects of military investment, which could even include income, payment of soldiers, um, building of bases. There's a lot of different aspects that go into that. So that's why the two might look a bit different from each other. Thank you. And another question regards the UN again, and uh, one of the participants are wondering if uh, this situation will affect the UN's humanitarian emergency work. Absolutely, I think it will. I think it's going to be really hard to say that any type of development or aid work is going to be unaffected by coronavirus, both in the just sheer budgets um, as well as increased complications, more waves, um, accepting of people traveling abroad. Um, all of these kinds of things are going to now have to play into all of international work. Um, so definitely is going to be affected. Um, it's, I, it calls for new approaches as well, I think. Um, 
So yes, definitely affected. I hope for the best, of course, <laughs> but I do think that budgets are going to be a major issue. I think the economic uh, repercussions of COVID-19 are, are, are going to be quite challenging for, for us to face in our field of work. Mm. And I just want to ask you a, a follow-up question on that, because uh, when we saw the global economic recession from the 2008 economic crisis, uh, it took years to, uh, to work with that issue. And a lot of countries uh, started to become more and more nationalistic. What do you think about the prospects from now on and forward? Do you think this trend will continue or is this the time that uh, people will see the importance of international solidarity? Well, I think that's going, I mean, it's a fantastic question and I think it's going to change on regional levels a bit. Definitely when you look into the 2008 financial crisis, we can, we can actually see that our, our spending on coronavirus so far, I think as of the end of May, is the same amount that we spent trying to get out of the 2008 bud, uh, recession. And that's only looking at a couple of months of this crisis going on. And even since that first day, there's been a number of million and billion dollar commitments to the corona crisis. So we're seeing a different amount of money being spent from then compared to now. Um, I think it is going to take some years to, to have people bouncing back to normal. And I think there will be a new way of normal as well. Thank you. And uh, another question uh, on this theme as well, I would say, is that are we going to see less international cooperation and more egoism due to Corona? And there is a final comment. The positive thing with COVID-19 is that the Mother Earth is feeling better and we have fresh air. Absolutely. That is like a really great um, outcome from the lockdown. Um, however, I do fear that once we return um, to, you know, everybody back at work, industries back on their full running, that countries are going to want to double up on what they were doing before. And that all of the progress we've made to make Mother Earth happy um, might again return back to our status quo. That's why it's a super important point now to be having these discussions on how to make climate change, how to make green reconstructions. All of those conversations are at a critical moment now because once countries come out of this, I think that there will be kind of two elements at play. A lot of their budget may be spent on their own economies, helping their, their populations rather than contributing to international organizations. But at the same time, a lot of economies depend on these international organizations to facilitate trade. And when we were talking about food insecurity before, we had some smaller European countries who are really going to struggle without EU facilitating trade, without having increased imports as well as exports, but more so imports because they are dependent economies. So in this sense, people, yes, may become a bit more egotistical in preferencing their own developmental economy rather than putting it into overseas development aid um, or anything like that. But on the other side, we're going to see a lot of smaller countries and countries in need reaching out to these international institutions. Thank you. And another question concerns digitization. It says that how do you think the accelerated digitization due to COVID-19 will affect peace? That's a really fantastic question and we haven't actually looked into that aspect of it. We did want to do some further work on cyber components of this um, as well as cyber components to peace. I mean Thus far, we've looked at cyber and we said, okay, if there's some sort of cyber attack or if there's some sort of increased online cooperation between two countries, well, then we'll see the indirect impact on, on neighborly relations, on policy. Um, but accelerated digital, digitalization due to coronavirus is a fantastic topic that definitely should be um, explored further. 
Thank you. And uh, one of the trends in this year's report is that peace has deteriorated these last nine out of 12 years. And how do you see uh, the peacefulness developments in the future? Is it more or less peaceful? And will we achieve the sustainable development goal 16? You had to ask that very, very tough question. <laughs> well, um, I think a lot of it is, I, I think we're really at a critical juncture right now. I mean, people talk about this. I mean, I've seen a plethora of articles over the past week saying you had maybe the, the pre 9-11, post 9-11 world. You had the pre 2008 recession, post 2008 recession world. Now we're gonna have a pre and a post coronavirus world. Mm -hmm. And that's the narrative I'm seeing a lot. And in the short term, we have all of these predictions that until countries are able to revive their economies, things are not looking so fantastic as far as multilateral cooperation goes, um, as well as civil unrest. We think that civil unrest is going to increasingly, um, increasingly be problematic around the world. Um, Maybe not under IEP, but for myself, I think there's going to be greater internal conflicts for the time coming up and possibly less external conflicts um, just in the short term. But when we look longer, um, if you remember the statistic about um, refugees and internally displaced people, people migrating, um, climate change making resources scarce, I hate to say that there's a bit of a grim outlook there. Um, and all of those factors being threat multipliers, being um, crisis, exasperators, et cetera. Um, I don't know if I have a positive outlook. I wish I did. We wish so too. <laughs> but uh, if there's anyone to ask, it should be you, I believe. So let's hope we can get a, a more positive talk next year. Uh, there's a few more questions. I think we will be able to, to have time for a couple of more. So there's one, uh, countries in the world have very different natural pros and cons, depending on where they are geographically located. It goes without saying that the lack of food and water in combination with often occurring natural disasters will increase the number of conflicts in the area. My question is, do you have an example of a country in a geographically hardship place that still works a lot with positive peace and that is peaceful in your index? Thank you for a very interesting presentation. That's a really fantastic question. Um, we've seen that natural disasters um, don't have a geographical um, place in which they happen most often. They are across all countries of all peacefulness levels. It's those that have high peace that can respond better. And if I remember correctly, in some of the Asian countries such as um, Japan or Singapore, that may be good examples to look into. Um, I'll have to pull up the report myself to get the specific list out. Um, but if I'm remembering correctly, that's where to look, yes. And the uh, US and China might be two of the superpower countries in the world at the moment and are both placed in the lower and right square of your diagram about peacefulness and economics. What obstacles does that bring to increase positive peace or are the hierarchies of countries changing? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. They are both in that lower corner uh, as far as positive peace goes. Um, the United States single-handedly for the incarceration rate that exists there. And so we can see that from these, they are going to struggle more so than let's say any European country to bounce back to their pre-crisis conditions. Um, as far as hierarchies or global order, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, Global order m may shift a bit. We'll see. I think a lot of that is also going to go back to this conversation of multilateralism. As somebody who myself believes in liberal multilateralism, institutionalism, world order, I think that that's where the new powerhouses are going to come out of. Um, China, however, had 
some pre-economic conditions, it is not highly dependent on international um, on international imports necessarily. So they are a little bit better positioned to bounce back from this. But regardless, they do impact positive piece in where they put their foreign investments and where they choose to invest in their own local communities. Specifically right now in the United States, when you see the horrible incidents that have been happening and the protests um, and the civil unrest overall, how the government decides to react mm. is going to really change the course for the United States here. I mean, it's a very pivotal moment for them as well, given crisis, given increased unemployment rates, given this unrest, um, anti-government protest, et cetera. It's really reaching a climax of multiple components going on. Um, and if the U.S. budgets are internally focused, you know, there is going to be less of a budget for the U.N., for all of these um, global um, development projects that the U.S. would normally be involved in. So in a way, yes, um, the health of others impacts the health of, of, of the world. And we particularly see that also with um, good neighborly relations is one of our, is one of our pillars. So if there's increasing tensions happening between neighboring countries, the world will be less peaceful. So I hope that kind of answers some of the components of that question. Uh, another question that I would like to raise is, uh, is uh, the diagram that you had where you show that inequality on peace increased since 2012 and it increased a lot. What, why is that so? What changed? So what we saw in 2012 was some of the most severe conflicts we've seen over the past two decades. We've seen intense internal conflicts. I mean, if you look at the Middle East in particular, since the Middle East and the North Africa are the least peaceful countries, you had those conflicts spilling over. You had Arab Spring transforming into conflicts. And then we see, we see Europe really expanding further, um, EU being being uh, more cherished, let's say, um, and their economies getting better, their economies growing, their ability to invest in their own um, structures as well. We see that overall, all the positive piece eight pillars, they're investing in them more. They're more able to approach those kinds of, of problems. And that also does have to do with, with, well, who are the watchdogs, the EU, this institution that's created um, for the purpose of sustaining and creating peace. Um, you could say that that might be some sort of, sort of um, cause and effect there between EU institutions and these countries becoming more peaceful. Um, however, if you look at the graph again, while it's widening, um, the, the least peaceful countries are at a much more strict line than the most peaceful that are just kind of slowly staggering down. So it really does have to do with these intense conflicts, um, threat multipliers, ecological threats, et cetera, everything. You see them hitting the two countries much differently. And we have the final question before we need to wrap this very interesting seminar up. And it's a, a person that says that he's very interesting interested on the work of the MENA region countries and their development economically, demo, uh, their democratic development and their peaceful developments. How is it gonna look like? Any progress? Or sorry, any prog prognos prognosis? <laughs> what are the <laughs> prospects for the future? Okay, what are the prospects for the future? I mean, we have seen some positive developments in, in the area as far as since the downfall of ISIS there has been uh, less um, intense internal conflict, less deaths from terrorism. And these are all really um, fantastic growths that the region has had. Um, I also want to say that, of course, every single country is, has different challenges right now. I don't think we can say that the Middle East is all facing the same challenge. Um, specifically, um, as far as a prognosis goes, um, I, I mean, I think it's, it's 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 quite difficult to say because some of these countries are in growing pain democracy like i mentioned before 
Um, and so possibly in the short term, they're gonna continue with these pains, but in the long term, they'll be able to transition fully into, uh, into well-developed democracies. Um, on the other hand, you see some countries, uh, maybe the ones that are more oil dependent right now are going to be really struggling as far as the international oil market goes. Um, but here again, we have to split things into short term versus long term. Um, and, and it really is country dependent as well there. I, I think it's a common error to say the Middle East is facing one challenge or, you know, the Middle East is all going to fall and develop uh, at the same rate at the same time. So really diverse answers there. Um, and yes, just if you're interested in a specific country to look at the data in the, in the index, we also have an interactive map that you can click and see everything and you can sort by indicator too. Thank you so much, Leah. It has been a great pleasure hosting you and we hope that we will be able to host you next year as well. Uh, I hope everyone got some new knowledge to share and talk about with your colleagues and your friends and your family. And most importantly, that we act. This is the most important uh, lesson because we need to act on a number of issues in order to change the course of the world where it's heading right now. Yes. So do you have any final remarks that you want to highlight or? I mean, I think you said it pretty perfectly. Now there's so many things that are balancing, teetering on an edge, which could really go either way. We can take this opportunity of reconstruction in a positive way towards green reconstruction, towards furthering equality within countries and with neighboring countries, um, or we can choose an alternative route. Um, so this is really a, a critical juncture that we're at now. Um, and I, I hope also to come back next year with some more positive news. <laughs> we're looking forward to that too. Thank you for tonight and I wish you a uh, good night and best of luck on inspiring more people to act. Thank you, Leah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me.